I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963. Thank you all so much for your prayers and support. God bless. Will the rapture of the church take place on Rosh Hashanah 2020, which begins on the evening of Friday, September 18th, and ends on the evening of Sunday, September 20th? The Jewish prophet Amos records that God declared he would do nothing without first revealing it to his servants, the prophets. From the Old Covenant to the New, Genesis to Revelation, God provides picture after picture of his entire plan for mankind and one of the most startling prophetic pictures is outlined for us in the Jewish feasts of Leviticus 23. The Hebrew word for feasts, moed, literally means appointed times. God has carefully planned and orchestrated the timing and sequence of each of these seven feasts to reveal to us a special story. The seven annual feasts of Israel were spread over seven months of the Jewish calendar at set times appointed by God. They are still celebrated by observant Jews today. But for both Jews and non-Jews who have placed their faith in Jesus, the Jewish Messiah, these special days demonstrate the work of redemption through God's Son. The first four of the seven feasts occur during the springtime. These are Passover, Unleavened Bread, First Fruits, and Weeks, and they all have already been fulfilled by Christ in the New Testament. The final three feasts, Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and tabernacles occur during the fall, all within a short 15-day period. Many Bible scholars and commentators believe that these fall feasts have not yet been fulfilled by Jesus. However, the blessed hope for all believers in Jesus Christ is that they most assuredly will be fulfilled. As the four spring feasts were fulfilled literally and right on the actual feast day in connection with Christ's first coming, these three fall feasts, is believed by many, will likewise be fulfilled literally in connection to the Lord's second coming. In a nutshell, here is the prophetic significance of each of the seven Levitical feasts of Israel. Passover, pointed to the Messiah as our Passover lamb, whose blood would be shed for our sins. Jesus was crucified on the day of preparation for the Passover, at the same hour that the lambs were being slaughtered for the Passover meal that evening. Unleavened bread, pointing to the Messiah's sinless life, as leaven is a picture of sin in the Bible making him the perfect sacrifice for our sins. Jesus' body was in the grave during the first days of this feast, like a kernel of wheat planted and waiting to burst forth as the bread of life, first fruits. Pointing to the Messiah's resurrection as the first fruits of the righteous, Jesus was resurrected on this very day, which is one of the reasons that Paul refers to him in 1 Corinthians 15:20 as the first fruits from the dead. Weeks are Pentecost occurred 50 days after the beginning of the Feast of Unleavened Bread and pointed to the great harvest of souls and the gift of the Holy Spirit for both Jew and Gentile who would be brought into the Kingdom of God during the Church Age. The Church was actually established on this day when God poured out His Holy Spirit and 3,000 Jews responded to Peter's great sermon and his first proclamation of the Gospel. Trumpets, the first of the Fall Feasts Many believe this day points to the rapture of the Church when the Messiah Jesus will appear in the heavens as he comes for his bride, the church. The rapture is always associated in scripture with the blowing of a loud trumpet, as we read in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 18, and 1 Corinthians 15, 51 and 52. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain should be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. The Feast of Trumpets is also referred to as the Feast of the New Moon, for it is the only annual feast of God that commences with the lunar sign from the heavens. In ancient times, Jewish religious authorities had to wait until the new moon was actually seen by reliable witnesses. Before the month's activities could begin, the appointed time is stretched into two days, 
as no man knoweth the day or the hour. Thus, the authorities did not know when the Feast of Trumpets would actually commence. They did not know the day or hour. Jesus Christ made specific reference to this fact when he spoke of the time he would fulfill his promise to return. He said no one knows about that day or hour. It is the only feast day that is named as such because they just didn't know which day was the correct day. Why two days? It is because of the uncertainty of when to declare the day because the beginning of the Feast of Trumpets is based on the sighting of the first visible crescent of the new moon. And since the days counted are from the new moon to the next, no one is sure if it's the 29th or the 30th day of the month, so to be sure, they count both. During the feast, the trumpet is blown a total of 100 times, with the final horn blast lasting much longer than the first 99 blasts. This final blast pictures the trumpet sound, which many believe will announce the rapture of the church, which Paul mentions in 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Thessalonians 4. Disclaimer. I make no prediction of the Lord's return, as we cannot know the exact timing, but I am referencing scripture that gives us the information that points to a specific set of days as clues in his word. Day of Atonement. Many believe this prophetically points to the day of the second coming of Jesus when he will return to earth, tabernacles, or booths. Many scholars believe that this feast day points to the Lord's promise that he will once again tabernacle with his people when he returns to reign over all the world. Many scholars believe the rapture will occur on the Feast of Trumpets. We are to be watching as Jesus commands us in Luke 21, 36. Watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. No matter what happens or doesn't happen on this upcoming Feast of Trumpets, we are to keep our eyes focused on Jesus. Hebrews 12, 2. Fixing our eyes on Jesus the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Are your eyes fixed on Jesus? He is returning. Welcome to the Watchman YouTube channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. Psalm 917. The wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations that forget God. The latest on California's wildfire emergency, a series of massive fires burning up to 1,000 acres an hour are blamed for at least five deaths. Tens of thousands of people in Northern California have been told to leave their homes. Satellite images show heavy smoke and ash, which made the Bay Area's air quality the worst in the world. Carter Evans is in a hard hit Vacaville, California. Carter, what, what are you seeing there? Well, good morning. This is one of the many homes that was destroyed. It's really unrecognizable. This fire was so hot, you can see how it melted this glass here. It looks like uh, this came from a window. Now, in addition to the five people who died, at least 30 firefighters and other civilians have been injured. Flames continue to advance toward more communities in Northern California overnight. More than 10,000 firefighters are on the front lines, but officials say even that is not enough. Honestly, our resources are stretched very far. With hundreds of major fires burning in the state. Just push it back off this fire line. Some homeowners are taking matters into their own hands. How much fire line did you cut? Over the period of the day, we probably cut about three quarters of a mile. Just keep it away. Zach Algen and his sons protected their property with nothing more than some shovels and brakes. 
we weren't going to wait for it to come to us. We were thinking, what can we do to protect our neighborhood? Because everybody was abandoned. We had nothing to do but just defend ourselves. Uh, the sky, which I've never seen before, was totally glowing red all around. So I knew there was a, a very big, very angry fire coming this way. Firefighters Chase McGrew and his brother Russell okay. had just gotten off duty Wednesday when their father, a retired firefighter himself, called to say the massive LNU complex fire was threatening their childhood home. So this has got to be sentimental to you. Yeah, that was a big concern was, was losing the house. My dad's put so much work into this place, built it so much from what it was, and this meant a lot to not only him but us. Very sentimental. Now, some of these fires appear to have been sparked by some of the worst lightning storms in California in decades. So far, at least 175 structures have been destroyed. 50,000 more are in danger. A historic lightning siege. That's how California officials are describing what's stoking those massive wildfires that threatened tens of thousands of homes and have already claimed lives. Dale Hurd has the story. More than 10,000 lightning strikes, triple-digit temperatures, and high winds have created what California fire officials are calling extreme fire behavior. Multiple wildfires have now burned into each other, creating giant blazes called complexes, including one near Santa Clara that has burned nearly 100,000 acres. The size and complexity at which these incidents are burning is challenging all aspects of emergency response. The size of the fires has doubled since Wednesday to more than 124,000 acres, threatening 25,000 buildings. Officials had to shut down Interstate 80 between San Francisco and Sacramento when flames jumped the highway. Travis Air Force Base has ordered non-mission essential personnel to evacuate. Residents in nearby Vacaville were roused before dawn Wednesday with orders to flee. I could see the red glow and I was hearing explosions. One woman said she only escaped the flames because a friend called to warn her. She told me before it came that it was coming, so that helped. Otherwise, we probably wouldn't have known in time. But some residents refused to evacuate. Just trying to save the house. My father-in-law's house is down there. I'm headed there next. Some evacuees waited in a parking lot of a church away from the fires, hoping they'll have homes to come back to. Who would have thought that 2020 would be like this? It's just insane. Who would have thought that 2020 would be like this? It's just insane. One of the most well-known verses of scripture showing that God controls the weather is found in Matthew 8, 23 through 27. Now when he got into a boat, his disciples followed him, and suddenly a great tempest arose on the sea, so that the boat was covered with the waves, but he was asleep. Then his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we are perishing. But he said to them, Why are you fearful, O you of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. So the men marveled, saying, Who can this be, that even the winds and the sea obey him? We are fast approaching a time known as the tribulation, that Jesus says will be the worst time in human history, as we read in Matthew 24, 21. For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. We are currently witnessing events that will continue to become more frequent and more intense until God pours out his final judgments on an unbelieving and unrepentant world. The world is witnessing unprecedented extreme weather that will carry over into the tribulation period, and the news headlines prove it. The world in the very end will be consumed and destroyed by fire, as we read in 2 Peter 3.10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. We are not in the tribulation period yet, but we are getting extremely close. Jesus, speaking to his disciples about the signs of his coming and the end of the age, declares this in Matthew 24, 12. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. The Bible tells us lawlessness is the violation of God's commandments, as we read in 1 John 3, 4. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. Sin will be so rampant and so commonplace in the last days that the love people once had for one another, for many, will be non-existent. In this prophecy, Jesus Christ is describing an ongoing breakdown in the relationship with God. And since people's love for God is waning, it will be evident in the way people treat one another as well. 
A symptom may be that the love toward other people is decreasing, but the real cause is that the relationship with God is cooling off. This is what we are witnessing in our world today. Gun violence continues to plague New York City streets as the number of shootings for the year nears a thousand. However, as the violence rages on, it seems that there is no end in sight. Today, another dramatic surge in gun violence. Shootings happening in all boroughs except Staten Island. The NYPD confirming at least 48 incidents over the weekend. At least 59 people injured and 12 people killed within 72 hours. The violence triggering a threat from President President Trump tweeting to New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio, law and order, if the mayor can't do it, we will. The president threatening to send federal troops as he did to other cities like Seattle and Portland. Shooting incidents in the city more than doubling in the last 24 hours compared to the same time period last year. Statistics following a pattern since June when shooting surged by 130 percent as the coronavirus lockdown began. During the month of July, there were 244 citywide shooting incidents compared to the 88 shootings during that same time period last year. And for the entire year up until the end of July, there has been a 72 percent spike in citywide shooting incidents. Police leaders blaming Mayor Bill de Blasio for his $1 billion slash from the NYPD's budget following nationwide calls to defund the police following growing outcry against police brutality and racial injustice. Many also criticizing the mayor for allowing defendants to go free without posting bail and the release of thousands of prisoners from Rikers Island due to coronavirus concerns. A deadly night in New York City and more gun violence this morning. Police say at least 11 people were shot overnight. Three of them died. A baseball hat and used medical gloves are in the center one in New York City's latest homicide scenes. Police say around 2 o'clock this morning, three men were shot at the corner of East 179th Street and Clinton Avenue in the Cretona section of the Bronx. A 60-year-old man died. It had to be like at 10, 12 at least. It was really loud. Two hours later and less than one mile away in Tremont, a 44-year-old man was also fatally shot in the back of the head on Park Avenue. At around 10 o'clock last night in downtown Brooklyn, police say a 23-year-old man was also fatally shot in his head on the corner of Fulton Street and Flatbush Avenue. After this pandemic, you know, a crisis, you know, people going, you know, crazy for nothing, you know, they want to shoot people. According to the NYPD, at least 11 people were shot in six hours across New York City. The latest numbers show shootings are up 82 percent in the city compared to the same time last year. Gun arrests are down 8 percent. Some of the violence is because of the pandemic. No, the court's not open. And this man believes bad seeds are trying to exploit a tough time for the city. Who, who doesn't condemn violence except for the people who's doing it? People are out here trying to live and people want peace. People want equality, people want justice, you understand? But uh, you have some other people that just, you know, they love chaos. And any chaos, anything that's going on, they will take advantage of it. Today, a Stop the Violence march was held by police and police unions to show support for local law enforcement. Leaders saying certain police reform is the reason for the spike in violence. The criminals basically know that their hands are untied. They're not afraid of, of a police officer coming up to them. The president of the Detectives Endowment Association saying bail reform and city ordinances that prevents cops from sitting, standing, or kneeling on a suspect's stomach or back are the problem. What's going on? Is the government officials in the state and on the city level have enacted laws that have handcuffed the police and the police cannot go out and do their job. The Apostle Paul in his epistle to Timothy tells us in the last days society would be in a total immoral meltdown. 2 Timothy 3 1 through 5. But know this that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. Police are investigating a disturbing assault that was caught on camera at a protest in downtown Portland. Investigators say it looks like a group of people attacked a man who had crashed his truck. That man was taken to the hospital in serious condition. Cell phone video captured a disturbing scene in the streets of Portland last night. I just want my baby like that. It apparently all started when a person screamed that she was robbed at the corner of 4th and Taylor. That's right near the Justice Center where crowds were protesting. A man came to help her and appeared to eventually get back in his truck. But the crowd followed him, and a woman who appeared to know the driver of that truck was tackled and assaulted in the street. The truck then drove off. 
According to police, a group chased the driver, then he crashed the truck just a few blocks away. The videos then pick up with the man outside the car and being shoved to the ground. You can see him being punched and kicked several times. Then, video that's too graphic for television shows the man being kicked in the face, which appears to leave him unconscious. The woman who was assaulted earlier also appears and can be heard screaming. Tonight we're hearing from the truck driver who was brutally beaten over the weekend by demonstrators in Portland. Meanwhile, protesters are renewing their battles with federal agents. Correspondent Dan Springer has the latest tonight. Tonight, Portland police are wondering where the next attack will be. Last night, it was back at the Immigration and Customs Enforcement Office with dozens of federal officers inside. Portland police declared a riot after protesters started a fire, broke several windows, and threw softball-sized rocks at officers. We all should be condemning the violence that's occurring. Increasingly, there are calls for citizens to rise up and say no more. Police Chief Chuck Lavelle wrote, The solution is in a critical mass of community and partners coming together to denounce this criminal activity and call it out. For the first time since his brutal beating over the weekend, Adam Hayner is speaking out, saying he stopped to help a transgender woman who was beaten and robbed, but then her assailants turned on him and his girlfriend. I'm just trying to make sure she gets in the car and I get in the car and we both get out of there and by the end of it, you know, I'm wrecked and unconscious on the side of the road and she's trying to figure out what happened to me. Hayner says he was called a racist during the attack. Police are still looking for their main suspect, Marquise Love, who reportedly posted on social media while in hiding, defending his actions and asking for money. Marquise Love has an extensive arrest record with seven different bookings. Twice he was charged with domestic assault, but the district attorney dropped both of those cases for lack of evidence, a problem Portland officials don't seem to have in this case. We have new video this morning that is really cringeworthy here. A motorcyclist is seriously injured after a pickup truck crosses the lanes here and then just rams into that motorcycle rider who then hits the concrete barrier, falls off the bike there, and then just rolls on the highway. It is so bad. It happened on southbound I-25 near Castle Pines this afternoon. The rider was taken to a hospital with serious bodily injuries and even some head trauma. That person's condition this morning is not known, however. Colorado State Patrol says they're still searching for the driver of that pickup truck, and they call this a case of road rage. One of the many signs that we're living in the end times is the epidemic of wickedness and violence that is sweeping the world today. Jesus tells us when society parallels the days of Noah, he will return as we read in Matthew 24, 37 through 39. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. So what was going on in Noah's day that parallels our day? To find out the answer, we need to go back to the book of Genesis 6, 5 through 13. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God. And Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. There is no doubt about the hour in which we live being the season for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ as we link Matthew 24 verses 12 and 37 through 39 with 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. The Bible describes our day very clearly from these scriptures. The condition of wickedness and violence that caused the earth to be destroyed in Noah's day is the same condition our earth is in today. John 15, 18 through 20. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, 
they will also persecute you. More anti-Christian bias is raising its ugly head in America, this time in Boston, Mass. Hal Shirtliff leads a Christian civic organization called Camp Constitution. Apparently, private groups are allowed to raise flags on a city flagpole each September 17th. That's Constitution Day. Let's see, there's the Turkish flag, which depicts an Islamic star and a crescent moon. Also allowed, a gay pride rainbow flag and a pink and blue transgender flag. And flags are raised by others honoring Mexico, Brazil, Ethiopia, Puerto Rico, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You get the idea. The city has allowed a total of 248 private groups to raise flags. But Shirtless Group, Camp Constitution, nope. They applied to raise their flag, a Christian flag like this one. A white field, red cross with a blue square in the upper corner. No dice. Rejected by the city of Boston. Why? The city says because their application stated the group wanted to fly a Christian flag on the city flagpole for an hour, just like the other groups. But apparently the city of Boston mistakenly thinks if a private group flies a Christian flag on a city flagpole, it will be an endorsement of religion. Based on that reasoning, flying a gay rainbow flag then would be an endorsement of the gay rights agenda. Or a Turkish flag would be an endorsement of an Islamic nation that actually committed genocide against Armenians in 1915. That Turkey? Oh yeah, that one. Hogwash. Flying the Christian flag just like allowing others to fly theirs is not the city's endorsement of anything. It's simply recognizing the free speech rights of private citizens. Their right to participate in a day honoring the greatness of a document committed to individual liberty and collective freedom for all American citizens. Those actions must include, not exclude, Boston's Christian citizenry. Denying the Camp Constitution Group's First Amendment right, while at the same time allowing other groups to fly their flags, is discriminatory. It shows partiality, and that is unconstitutional. Liberty Council has filed a brief in the First Circuit Court of Appeals on behalf of Shirtliff and Camp Constitution. Not far from Boston, where this is happening, is Plymouth, Massachusetts. Now, that's where one of my ancestors first arrived in North America on the Mayflower. Thomas Rogers was among the Puritan settlers who signed the Mayflower Compact, a document committing the new colony to democracy and the glory of God and the furtherance of the Christian faith. That's why my ninth great-grandfather came to New England for religious freedom. He and half of the pilgrims died during that harsh first winter in America. I'm sure Rogers and the other Plymouth Colony settlers would be grieved to know that 400 years later, Christians are being denied the right to simply fly a Christian flag on a flagpole. Yes, it's happening just 40 miles from where the pilgrims landed to help found the greatest Judeo-Christian country on earth. Isn't it sad it's come to this? May God help us and the city where the first shot of the American Revolution was heard around the world. 1 Corinthians 16, 13. Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! The signs of Jesus soon return are so strong now and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved.
God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive in faith the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in Him and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. Biblical repentance is changing your mind about Jesus Christ and turning to God in faith for salvation. Turning from sin is not the definition of repentance, but it is one of the results of genuine, faith-based repentance towards the Lord Jesus Christ. Time is short. Accept Jesus today.